Welcome to Mayor Brown's Tech Talks podcast. Each podcast is designed to provide insights on legal issues relating to technology transactions and keep you up to date on the latest trends in data, digital, outsourcing, and software by drawing on the perspectives of practitioners who have executed technology transactions around the world. You can subscribe to this series on all major podcasting platforms. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, listeners. Our topic today is Beyond Brexit. How does the new relationship between the UK and EU affect technology transactions? Uh, And just to get everybody up to speed here, uh, as most of our listeners probably know, the UK formally left the European Union and the broader European economic area on January 31st of 2020. Uh, However, the relationship between the UK and the EU remained pretty much unchanged for the duration of a Brexit transition period that lasted until the end of 2020, uh, when the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement was signed and came into force from the start of this year. Uh, In this episode, we'll be exploring the impact that the end of the Brexit transition period and the new UK-EU trade agreement has on technology transactions covering Europe. Uh, And we're going to focus particularly on the effect on technology licensing, data privacy, and international data transfers, employment and immigration rules, and financial services regulatory requirements. I'm your host, Julian DeBell. I am a senior associate in Mayor Brown's technology transactions practice. I'm joined today by four of my colleagues, Oliver Yaros, uh, a partner in our technology transactions practice based in London. Chris Chapman, a partner in our financial services regulatory and enforcement group also based in London. Um, And we have also Chris Fisher, a partner in our UK employment practice. And finally, we have here Elizabeth Stern, who leads our global mobility and migrating practice out of Mayor Brown's Washington DC office. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. Um, Oliver, I'm going to turn first to you and and ask about the effect that the end of the Brexit transition period might have on the creation and use of technology and data. Many clients will have complex arrangements in place under which technology and data might be created, used, and shared within their organization, and also with customers and service providers across Europe, including the UK. Oliver, how has Brexit affected the use of technology, first of all. Thanks, Julian, and hello, everyone. Well, when trying to work out how the end of the Brexit transition period might affect your use of technology in Europe, I think it is helpful to split the issues you might have to address into three categories. The first is the ownership rights you might have in the technology you're creating or having created for you in Europe. The second is the technology and outsourcing arrangements under which you might be licensed to use technology across Europe. And the third thing is any arrangements under which you might be embedding technology in products you might be providing to customers in Europe. So let's uh, take each of those points in turn. First of all, around the ownership of any technology you might create. Well, the good news is there isn't really much of a change there. Code, code in software, for example, that is created in the UK will be protected by copyright. Uh, That will still be recognised in Europe if it's created in the UK and will still be recognised in the UK if it's created in the EU. So that's good news. There is one area which is in database rights. So if you've got technology that populate databases automatically in terms of recording or logging events, then uh, databases that are created in the UK, that won't be recognised in the EU and vice versa going forwards. So that's a bit of a problem area, but otherwise pretty much unchanged. The second issue is around the arrangements you might have under which technology might be licensed to you across Europe. 
This is a bit of a tricky area because you've got to look quite carefully at the, the way in which the agreements are structured. We've seen quite a lot of customers uh, of technology arrangements get into hot water because they've been licensed to use uh, technology in the EU as the scope of the territory of the license. And of course, the UK is no, no longer no longer part of the EU. So you sometimes see vendors tapping them on the shoulder, perhaps as a result of a, an audit to say, actually, you're no longer licensed to use this technology in the territory in which you are now using it. So there is some work there to be done to make sure that the agreements you have in place do stand up post Brexit. And the final thing I'd like to point out is about the exhaustion of rights when technology is being embedded in, in products. So you might have uh, products that are being so sold across borders from the UK to the EU or the other way around. You might have complex arrangements between distributors that are distributing those products in different territories. You might even have a competitor in one of those territories that's trying to stop you from entering the market with your uh, products that embeds technology. The issue you might have there is that uh, there is still exhaustion of rights coming into the UK. So if something is put in the market in the EU, uh, a UK rights holder can't stop that product uh, entering the UK market. But if something is put on the market in the UK first, and then a, uh, a distributor tries to put that on the market in the EU, the EU rights holder or competitor could prevent the sale, the resale of that product that embeds technology in the EU. So you've got to be quite carefully about uh, what Brexit means as far as absorption of rights are concerned. Okay, and what about uh, privacy and other data protection concerns? So data privacy is, is an area of concern for lots of clients. And there really are two things here to be aware of. One is compliance with the rules and also uh, cross uh, border transfers. So uh, the UK, when it was a member of the EU, adopted the GDPR. Uh, now that we're outside of the EU, uh, we no longer have the EU GDPR, but we have the UK GDPR, which is pretty much the same thing if you, if you read the, the letter of the, the law. Uh, so uh, when thinking about what that means for your, for your business, it may mean that activities you're doing from the UK have to comply with the UK GDPR, but also have to comply with the EU GDPR. And that may mean that you've now got some additional obligations you need to think about. You may need to appoint a representative in the EU uh, if you don't have any other businesses in the EU. Uh, you won't be able to benefit from the one-stop shop if there's a security incident. So you'd have to deal with all of the 27 regulators rather than just one. Uh, you may also have to do due diligence as far as your use of suppliers is concerned where you're passing in personal data. You will have to get them to comply with the UK and the EU GDPR, uh, particularly around things like data transfers. So, yeah, what about cross-border? transfers of personal data, what changes might you have to make in technology agreements that require this? So again, this is, um, this is an area of concern for quite a lot of clients, uh, because although at the moment the regimes are very similar, um, it is a requirement for the UK uh, to recognize the EU as being an adequate jurisdiction if transfers can continue to go from the UK to, to Europe. And there's a requirement for the European Commission to, uh, to deem the UK as being an adequate jurisdiction for data transfers if data is going to flow from the EU to the UK without any further restrictions, as was the case pre the end of the Brexit transition period. At the moment, there is a provisional adequacy decision that allows data to flow across from the EU to UK and the other way around uh, without any uh, issues up until the end of June. The UK has said that data transfers to the EU can continue. So if you're using suppliers based in the EU to process UK data, that can continue as it is. 
Uh, but going the other way, the European Commission has at the moment published a draft adequacy decision for the UK, but it hasn't been approved yet. And the European Data Protection Board is going to uh, provide its opinion sometime in April as to whether that should uh, be passed. So it is yet to be seen whether that data transfers from the EU to the UK will be able to continue on as they have done uh, post June. So businesses need to be aware that this may be an issue. They need to map their data flows to make sure they understand how data is transferring cross border between the UK and the EU. And they also need to be thinking about the, the way in which the regimes might diverge in future, particularly around transfers to other countries like the US and China and elsewhere, given recent European developments uh, that restrict that. All right, let's turn now to employment issues. Um, obviously, technology transactions and outsourcing agreements often involve the hiring, firing, and transfer of key personnel between clients and suppliers. Uh, many clients will have technology and outsourcing agreements with suppliers that cover operations across the whole of Europe, including the UK. Chris, what's the position as regards UK employment law in light of Brexit? Uh, thanks, Julian. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, as most people know, a lot of the UK's employment law um, has been derived from Europe over many, many years, and there is a huge amount of it in our legislation and case law. And even before Brexit, uh, even before the vote on Brexit happened, uh, one of the key questions was what was going to happen to that body of law um, if and when the UK left the EU. And the immediate answer is not very much yet. Uh, the UK government has passed legislation, um, which is the EU Withdrawal Act, which essentially provides that EU-derived employment law, as it applied in the UK on the 31st of December last year, will continue to apply. Uh, but the possibility um, that there will be change in the future is still there, and there, there are some EU employment laws that are considered, by employers at least, as overly complicated and unclear. And one of these, which is relevant for technology transactions, is um, the TUPI regulation. Now, that's the regulation which is derived from an EU directive, which applies to outsourcing in the UK, uh, and it's the law that creates an automatic transfer um, of employees from customers to suppliers whenever services are outsourced and they equally apply on subsequent recontracting of those services if they move from supplier to supplier and then when they come back in house again to the customer. One aspect of uh, GB that's widely seen as overly restrictive is the prohibition on changing employees employment terms when a GP transfer happens. TUPI essentially says that even if those changes are agreed with the employee, they are void and unenforceable, which causes significant issues in outsourcing when there is often a desire to harmonise employment terms once a transfer has taken place. So you're thinking the UK government might look to relax that aspect of TUPI? I Yes, I think so. It's... Um, one that's certainly on the list of what people think might change, but probably not just yet, I don't think. We saw recently how politically sensitive um, it's going to be for the UK government to be seen to be watering down employment protections in the wake of Brexit. Uh, last month, the government indicated that it was going to consult about uh, certain EU-derived EU employment laws, such as UK working time law, um, and possibly TUPI, um, but there was an immediate backlash from the UK press and the opposition parties in government, and within a week, the government had announced that it had dropped the idea of any review taking place. Okay, so no immediate changes then? I, there is one uh, possible change that is worth mentioning because it's relevant to the technology area. Um, it's the UK law on non-compete covenants. Uh, these are clauses in employment contracts which stop uh, an employee from working for a competitor or setting up in competition for a period of time after leaving employment. Normally in the UK, it's anything from between three and 12 months. 
that as a result of Brexit, the government has decided to review whether these clauses are making UK business less competitive. And interestingly, from a technology perspective, the government is comparing the position to that in California, where non-compete clauses are prohibited. And so the argument runs that this is what has allowed the West Coast tech sector to be so successful, um, i.e. startups can flourish and recruit the best people without any restrictions from things like non-competes. So the UK government um, it's quite attracted by this, so it's looking at two options. The first is a complete ban on non-compete covenants. And secondly, uh, they're considering the continental European model where employers must continue to pay salary or a percentage of salary during the period of the non-compete clause. Um, I think the, the first option is unlikely. I don't think we're going to see a complete ban on non-competes. Um, but the second is, is a possibility. Um, where, which will see employers have to pay for non-competes. Whether or not that will actually assist startups and small businesses, I'm, I'm not so sure. If employers have to pay for a non-compete covenant, then I think there's a risk that it will only be the larger established employers um, that will be able to afford them. And so they can use their strength and size to become even more dominant in the market. Um, but we'll have to see. Um, the consultation closed recently and we're waiting to hear what the government will do as a result of the responses it's received. Okay, uh, let's turn now to immigration and mobility, um, a, a, a thorny question in light of Brexit, uh, free movement um, across borders and the ability to provide services um, is now going to be regulated according to individual country schemes um, and, and Thus, customers who have technology transactions and outsourcing agreements that cover all of Europe and the UK will have previously been able to move key personnel who were European nationals between service centers in the UK and the EU without facing any barriers um, and may have to uh, reconsider what, what the restrictions are. Liz, what obligations do suppliers face when posting EU nationals uh, to the UK after uh, January 1st, 2021? Well, thanks, Julian. Um, it really, the EU nationals are now treated the same as rest of world nationals. Um, the customers are still going to be familiar with having dealt with this type of rule for other nationalities, including, for example, Americans uh, coming into the UK, um, Asian nationals coming into the UK, but it, it is a huge change that even for visits, there's no longer just an absolutely free movement. Um, the reality is that in order to have individuals work who are U EU nationals or the extended EEA in Switzerland in Britain, they'll need to get work permits under one of the schemes. And the main scheme now being the new point space system that is high, has been deemed to be high wage and high skill, but for which we would expect that most technology workers would in fact qualify. Hmm. Are there any important exceptions? There is. Um, Irish, uh, the, the common area between Ireland and the UK continues to govern, so the free movement provisions that applied previously continue between Ireland and the United Kingdom, but um, the EU uh, doesn't really get that benefit. There are also some exemptions in the points-based system that aren't, aren't truly exceptions. There are still applications that have to be made, but they would apply for opportunities for intra-company movement or for very highly skilled PhD types, individuals who are in areas that uh, Britain sees as a significant shortage occupation or um, the equivalent of rocket scientists, whether they're rocket yes. scientists or rock stars in some, other, in some other capacity. There are other approaches, but the baseline approach is really um, a points-based system in which it's mandatory that certain points be met, English language, a particular skills threshold that is a minimum skills threshold, 
um, uh, are among those qualifying. There is a minimum salary level, typically um, 25,600 uh, sterling, typically. Uh, there are some exceptions and variableness in that. And, and then there are optional points that need to get you to the, to the top level that allows you to cross the line. 70 points is the, uh, is the metric for it. Um, but as one can imagine, it, it really is a system not unlike other points-based systems that's trying to create a gateway for the worldwide categories, but for Ireland, um, for individuals that are going to presumably enrich the British economy. Okay, it's, so notwithstanding the exceptions, does every trip require a work permit? No, there are sometimes when individuals are coming in simply for a business visit. So, for example, let's say that there is a project that's being handled for um, a customer that is uh, headquartered out of still headquartered out of the um, out of the UK, but um, there are some project there is some project work that is being developed in the EU. For those in or, or somewhere else in the world, for those individuals, those EU nationals may need to come in simply to pick up some specifications, coordinate what the project is, understand what they'll be doing, but they'll be doing it outside the borders of Britain. And in view of that, they won't need to worry about getting a work permit. They'll come in as visit, bus, business visitors and they will get up to six months of an entry depending on the nature of the trip and the activity. Hmm. Where they do apply for a work permit, how easy or difficult is it going to be to obtain the permit? That right now, we have not seen the difficulty that we had anticipated. We thought that the systems might get log jammed for application, but currently there is an online application system. There are points calculators built into some of the tools that the Home Office has provided. And it is not too uh, difficult to get that through. Um, there isn't the same quota system. The quota was eliminated for skills entries that, that fit the points-based system. So there isn't that bottleneck that one sometimes sees with a quota. But it is something that employers, we think that would be employers, um, and, and I think even the receiving customers, want to be informed as to what categories of people can qualify. I think the reason for that is that if you look at technology transactions and you look at the contracts between uh, the supplier and the customer, there are cost issues associated with how difficult or easy it becomes to transfer people. And to be able to assess that, there needs to be some understanding of the ease or difficulty. It, it, it's a relatively straightforward system for individuals who are degreed um, uh, graduates of universities in the STEM uh, area of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and who are making a reasonable wage. And just to be clear, we're talking about uh, individuals coming from uh, the EEA EU into the UK, uh, right? What about individuals from the UK going into the EU? Well, um, that is, it's not quite as it's not quite as straightforward because there is no single system. Each country gets to decide what they consider the terms, mm -hmm. because now, of course, there isn't that free movement and that that ability of services. So um, that is that is a, a thornier issue to understand exactly what provisions there are that may be uh, bilateral um, uh, provisions that are very helpful to the UK because some of those have happened. And they may not be that helpful. Um, I think it's safe to say that suddenly having an, um, an information database for employers that tells them what are the baseline requirements and the heat indexes, where are the easy areas to go into and where are the areas where I really might run into problems and it may not be worth it, will start to impact um, activity. And I think also um, UK nationals going into the EU also need to worry about something that's a little bit similar to the 2P provisions we were talking about that Chris was addressing coming into Europe because the posted worker regulation that applies to the EU may also impact um, UK nationals going into the EU, i.e. there will be certain wage thresholds, et cetera, aside from visa provisions. 
and uh, wages and working conditions. So it's it's a bit of a regulatory um, uh, organizational system that has to be set up by employers. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, help our listeners understand really what they need to focus on here. What are some some top guidelines you would give to global suppliers in this context? Let's say top three. Um, I think the first one is lead planning, and it's part of the lead planning. It, it, in a way, it isn't just lead planning. It's actually what we were talking about, an, an overall regional view of where they've been sending people, how they've been staffing projects, and where um, attention needs to be paid to qualifications or to registrations or applications that may uh, create an issue. I think the second aspect, which is very critical, is tracking tracking who's going where. In the past, that just wasn't really necessary. Um, in most of the EU, there isn't even necessarily a border control. Now this becomes very important. Employers need to know where those employees are and they because they may trigger all kinds of regulatory issues, and so do the receiving customers. Um, some of these regulations impose obligations even on the receiving customers um, in the EU, for example. And finally, um, some thought needs to be given to, ha to how to optimize the available benefits that are offered by different countries. The flip side of knowing where not to go is are there locations that are particularly friendly? And there might suddenly, there might be some competition among jurisdictions to say, let me make it easier because I want to attract folks in. In a way, hearing about the UK and the possible non-compete is, is one flavor of that. Um, but I think uh, an analysis that goes around the EU as this post-Brexit period matures will be very important. Okay, Chris Chapman, let me turn to you. Uh, you work uh, with financial regulators in the financial services. How is Brexit going to affect the regulation of technology in that area? How will it affect fintech? Well, Julian, um, some people have described Brexit uh, as an opportunity for lighter regulation in the UK. So there is an idea that the UK will finally break free of the bureaucracy of Europe. Um, but I'm not so sure whether that is how it's going to work out. So if you use financial services as an example for many years in many areas, uh, the UK has been a leader in financial services regulation in the EU. So a lot of the EU regulations have been imported from the UK. Um, in a lot of other areas, the UK has had a really heavy input into the design of rules and regulations. And in many areas, the way in which the UK has applied EU laws has been stricter, um, more prescriptive, and has required higher standards of compliance than in some other EU areas. And it's a little bit hard, I think, to see the UK all of a sudden reversing that. Can you give any examples of, of uh, this type of uh, more restrictive approach? Yeah, well, I, think, um, I think when you think about fintech, two important areas are outsourcing um, and uh, payment services, two important areas of regulation. So if you, if you, uh, I think outsourcing is an interesting example because outsourcing is one of the few areas where you can point to parts where EU regulation is more prescriptive than in the UK. Usually it's the other way around, but okay. if you think of the, um, so for example, the European Banking Authority has um, issued some very detailed guidelines on what regulated outsourcing contracts are supposed to contain in this area. And the EU, the UK's um, equivalent guidelines are not as detailed. But you know, here we are today, post Brexit, and and those UK firms that used to have to comply with those European guidelines still have to comply with them. Um, and it has been the case for a while, and still is the case now, that even if you are a UK firm that doesn't strictly have to comply with those guidelines, you still have to pay. In a pretty close regard to them. You, you may have the flexibility to do something different, but if something goes wrong and the UK regulators come talking to you, you know, you're going to have some explaining to do as to why it was you felt that it was appropriate to put something different um, in place. 
And so it's sort of hard to see, although maybe there's an opportunity here for the UK to introduce, you know, their own rules, different rules in this area. It's a bit hard to see that they would want to introduce something that was overtly less strict than what um, the Europeans have in place. Hmm. Right, what about payment services? How are they going to be affected by the new Brexit era? So, so payment services, I think, are interesting for a different reason, because I would say that's an area um, where I think we're likely to see some regulatory change uh, in the next few years. Maybe not change, maybe clarification. But um, it, it's an area where you know it's heavily affected by technology. So it's quite hard for the regulations to keep up with developing technology. Um, and also the current regulations, uh, EU regulations, so the UK uses something based on that, are quite vague and deliberately vague to allow for sort of innovation and new technologies. But as a result, firms are struggling a bit to understand you know, what they're supposed to be doing. So I, I think over the next several years, we'll expect to see um, some changes there or some clarifications. But again, it's difficult to see that leading to lighter regulation, right? Because because what you want as a jurisdiction, you know, you want to attract payment services businesses, okay? So you want a payment services industry that's going to be effective, going to be efficient, going to work how it's supposed to, um, and it's going to be safe. And the way you achieve those things is by having tighter regulation, not lighter regulation. You know, if everyone is doing what they're supposed to, everything will work. And, you know, if you're the UK, you don't want an incident like Wirecard happening. That's, that's bad for market confidence. You know, Wirecard in Europe has been a really big driver of, of new regulation by BaFin, the financial regulator in Germany. They are moving towards, you know, more detailed and tighter new regulations in that area. Um, so I think it's, it's another example of Sure, maybe there's an opportunity for new regulation and divergence here. Maybe it's required. It's a little bit hard to see why um, either of the jurisdictions would want lighter regulation. So what is your overall impression of the future of fintech regulation? Well, you, you read a lot about um, not just financial services and other regulation, that the concern that Brexit will lead to a race to the bottom um, of regulation. I mean, for, for some of the reasons we've been talking about, I think that's unlikely. I wonder if, at least in some areas, it'll lead to a race to the top. So we've talked a bit about um, some of the reasons why, you know, actually you might want um, tight regulations. Um, in particular areas. And, and financial services is a, is a good example, I think, also of some sort of market forces and practical drivers that lead to that. So if, if you're a, a financial services firm and you want to operate internationally, you're sort of increasingly driven to meeting you know, the highest international standards. So if you're an international bank, for example, you know, you're really going to have to be able to show that you can meet the expectations of, say, US regulators in relation to anti-money laundering laws and sanctions, right? Because because if you're trading internationally, you're likely to be doing something that touches on their jurisdiction, so you've got to meet their standards. Another example would be if you're a payment services firm and you want to operate internationally and you're setting yourself up and you're setting up businesses and controls, you know, you do that um, to meet the highest level of expectations on you, because then you can export that to other jurisdictions. You don't start you know, you don't pick the lowest jurisdiction. So there's a lot of talk about international standards, but the, the more you operate internationally, and, and both the UK and Europe will want to, want to be attracting international firms, you know, the more you see incentives actually to meet high, the highest level of regulation in any event. You know, and that's, that's particularly true in financial services, but also I think it would increasingly be true in other areas as well. So there we go. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Chris Fisher as well, and Liz and Oliver. Uh, we appreciate your insights. Listeners, if you have any questions about today's podcast or anything else related to technology transactions and the law, please email us at 
techtransactions at mayorbrown.com. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this program. You can subscribe on all major podcasting platforms. To learn about other Mayor Brown audio programming, visit mayorbrown.com slash podcasts. Thanks for listening.